Good evening, everybody. My name is Reinhard Kattel. I am a professor and deputy director at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And I'm very happy to welcome you all here in the name of UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose and British Library to our lecture series on public value and public purpose in the 21st century with capitalism. And, well, you would think that uh, economics and public policy are very much about public purpose, right? That would be the sort of the logical conclusion. But of course, it would be wrong because a lot of the public policy frameworks, concepts that are used these days are actually not so much about public value and public purpose, but actually they're much more narrower concepts that usually actually are about how to get the state and the public out of the way of private value and private value creation and not actually thinking so much about the public value and public purpose. And, and this is part of the reason why we, together with the British Library, created this lecture series to talk to you, the public, about how should we think and talk about public value and public purpose. And this is why the lecture series is uh, not only about science and economics, but also about architecture, space, design, because this is what's around us, because this is the public space we go. And if you don't think about what's the value of it, what's the purpose of it, you might really lose the sight what's you know, the purpose of life, why do we are here. And so this is uh, why we have created this series. And, um, and I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Chayati Kosh, my dear friend. Um, Chayati comes from um, India, from Nehru University. She's a professor of economics there. And she has a, she's not only a, a terrific economist and author of um, numerous books, and, and, um, and one of them actually came out today in a paperback version, which Chayati and I and a friend of us co-edited, which is about alternative theories of economic development. So you should go and Google it and buy it. And it's, it's a really a doorstopper, or you can really kill somebody with it. Um, so it's a really thick book. But it's book. affordable, finally. Yes, it's, by now it's affordable, yeah, <laughs> because it's paperback version, so you can actually buy it. Otherwise, it, was, it wasn't really for public value. It was actually uh, <laughs> filling somebody else's coffers, uh, if you know what I mean. So, um, not ours, I mean, uh, <laughs> no, academics, you know, don't earn money. Uh, from books, at least. Uh, so where was I? Yes. Not, not only is that she's a prolific um, academic writer, but I think uh, Chayati is a really terrific columnist as well. So you might have read her work in, in, the, in, the, in the Guardian. But I really urge you to go and, and find the Network Ideas, uh, a, a website that she has co-founded co and co-created uh, that is very much about talking to the public about current issues, not only in India, but in the emerging markets, but also in, in, the, in the capitalism worldwide. So, and, and she's a really terrific columnist, so I really urge you to go and read her writing, which is really accessible and really fun to read. And there's every week there is something new from her or, 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 or co-author. So it's, it's a really, really great uh, thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that, that you're here, and you're also a member of our advisory board. Yeah. We're very happy yeah. to, give, to get your advice. And Charity will be talking today about um, uh, the public value of care and the politics of women's work, which I think is really one of the key topics of our time, actually. So I'm really happy. So the floor is yours. Please. Thank you really, very much, Raina. Well, you know, the moral of that story is always get a friend to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, really... Uh, looking forward to getting some of your reactions on all of this. I think some of what I have to say is probably well known to at least some of you. I see Sue Hima right here, who is one of the founders and people who has really, uh, we have all learned from over the decades, who's been talking about issues of care and, and so on. So it's, um, it's really good to be able to just, exp just bring out r really some of the very basic issues. What I'm going to talk about is, in a sense, obvious. But what is remarkable is how little public policy recognizes some of these very obvious things. And because public policy doesn't recognize it, I mean society also in a sense, we don't recognize it in the same way, uh, either as very essential or as um, you know, critically necessary. Okay, so yes, the public value of care. And um, I mean, I think there are enough women in the audience to know how the second part kind of follows automatically when I talk about this. But let's 
let's first look at why care has a public value and what, what is the big thing about care. So what is care? It's simply put, obviously it's looking after someone else. It's looking after the physical, psychological, emotional, social needs of others, okay? Dependent adults, children. So we normally think of care as looking after the young, the sick, the old. But in fact, it also involves looking after healthy adults. Again, I can see the women in the audience immediately responding, <laughs> knowing that this is uh, it's very, very common. Um, Marxist economists used to call this social reproduction, essentially, which is what that it is how you reproduce societies. It's how you generate the next, uh, the, not just the next generation, but the working class, and, and in fact, everything that makes society go. And what does it include? Obviously, cooking, cleaning, provisioning for the household. That's that's more serious than you might think when you live in London and you can provision things very easily. Uh, in large parts of the developing world, even getting your energy sources is something you have to go out there and do. You have to forage, you have to gather, you have to, and, and I will talk about that kind of thing. Then, of course, you know, the other kinds of domestic services and, and looking after people. Now, one of the things about care is that it is fundamentally relational. It's all about having a relationship, and that makes it different from other kinds of work. It means that you have to be responsive, you have to be flexible, you have to, you cannot really do it, a machine cannot do it completely. Even when you have machines assisting in it, it cannot take over. It necessarily requires human interaction. So even when it's mediated by technology, you have to have the human being at least as part of that process. It, it will not get delivered otherwise. So there are two kinds. There's the direct care work, which is, if you like, services that are essential for human survival, or which basically improve the quality of your life. And the indirect care is all the things that enable you to do the direct care. You know? So there's a huge, shall we say, supporting infrastructure and supporting employment that allows you to do that. So what is the public value? Well, I mean, obviously it's essential, right? You're not going to have societies without care. So that, that kind of goes without saying in a way. It contributes certainly to human well-being, to social development. But also, and this is actually what I'm going to be talking more about today, the direct and indirect care work, it is a huge subsidy to the formal economy. Because we don't adequately value it, which I will come to, it actually, I mean, capitalism survives because of all of this massive subsidy that direct and indirect care is providing to it. And, and therefore, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that the formal economy relies hugely on, and the undervaluing of that care is, in a sense, also necessary for the formal economy to keep going quite in the same way. The other aspect of it is that it is hugely employment generating if you do it properly. So if you stop undervaluing it, if you actually provide jobs, what we would consider as good quality jobs to provide care, you can actually provide huge employment and even more through the multiplier effects, uh, which is important nowadays because everyone's obsessed with how technology is gonna come over and take over a whole lot of routinized activities, not just in manufacturing, but even in services. You see, there's, there are all these fears about the robots coming, right? Or artificial intelligence doing stuff that clerks and other people, you know, clerical activities and all of that. Okay, and because it is employment generating, it then generates much more what we call multiplier effects on the economy. And why are those important? Because you see, multiplier effects basically means I hire 10 people here and then they have incomes, they go out and spend them. That generates demand for more goods and services. Those people go out and spend the money. That so there's a multiplier. Care work t typically delivers much more multiplier than investment in other activities because it's employment intensive. And so it can really generate what uh, this economist Hyman Minsky calls the bubbling up of growth. So it's not trickle down, it's a bubbling up. So the economy is going to grow because there's all that demand being generated down below. But as we know, it's massively, massively undervalued. And it's undervalued also by society, and therefore by governments, therefore by capital, by the whole system that is actually you know, relying on it, okay? And because it's undervalued by society, by markets, by governments, by everybody, <coughs> it is underprovided, which is to say we don't provide enough care, okay? It's, um, 
most societies, we actually don't provide desirable levels of care to people, okay? And so, yes, we provide the minimum. That's why we're all still around and people are still <laughs> existing and reproducing and all of that. But we do not provide enough to actually make it a society that is, shall we say, a happy society in, the, in a sense, you know? Uh, we don't manage to create sufficient care services to enable a stable, secure, peaceful society. And not only that, but the people who do provide it are typically working in often very poor conditions and with low pay. So care workers in all societies are like at the bottom of the pile in terms of wages, in terms of working conditions. And of course, they go to the very extreme where you are doing it in unpaid form. So in families and households, it's delivered as unpaid care. And there's no, nobody's asking about what conditions are you delivering it under? And what does it do to your own time use and your own emotional and other kinds of uh, you know, pressures and so on? Typically you find, therefore, it's provided by women, it's provided by migrants, the paid care work in most societies, in, in developed societies, a lot of it is done by migrants. Generally, those are the lower end of the social spectrum. In developing countries which are sending the migrants, even there you will find that the care work is provided by poorer people, typically women, typically you know, disadvantaged groups, minorities, lower castes, all of that kind of thing. And then there's this association with women's work. Women dominantly are involved in care, women are dominantly involved in unpaid care, and that has a kind of double whammy effect which I will talk about in a minute, but I just want to quickly, uh, I mean, this is, I don't know if you can even see this because it's a bit too small possibly for you, but it's a, it's a kind of typology of all the different kinds of care. And as you can see, there's all this unpaid stuff which is provided by households and by volunteer workers often in communities. And then, you know, you have the direct, which is directly looking after, and then you have all of the other kinds of work, cooking, cleaning, laundry, essential services, shopping, fetching, carrying. I'm mentioning fuel, wood, and water because it's huge, okay? It's actually huge. If you count just the women in India who have to fetch firewood and fuel wood, you are getting uh, in excess of 180 million whose major activity is fetching fuel, wood, and firewood. That's what they will call their major activity. So we're talking very large numbers having to do this, okay? Then you get the informal market work by paid workers, which is, um, in a sense, it's, um, it's done, it's when, I mean, households are employers of care services, right? Uh, I'm here talking to you because I am able to hire somebody back home who is doing, doing the cooking and cleaning in my household. Uh, it's an informal arrangement in that sense. It's not a formal setup, okay? She, on the other hand, cannot hire somebody else to do her household's care work. She has to go that and do that in addition to her paid work. But you have all of these, and you have them in d for different categories of people, okay? Uh, then you have the paid formal employment. And obviously, as you can see, you're going from pay unpaid to less paid to, you know, at least properly paid. Well, not properly, but at least paid in a, in a formal sense, okay? And so you have child care providers, daycare, you creches, you have pediatric workers, you have early education workers, geriatric services, you get the general picture, okay? And then of course for health care, you have nurses, doctors, clinical and medical <coughs> services. And even healthy adults need that kind of care as well. You need therapists or counselors or nutritionists and all kinds of other activities. And of course, all of these are enabled by the entire infrastructure that is set up. So you'll have to have, you know, the entire administrative backup, if you like, of providing all of these care services. So you can see already that this is, if you like, the sort of top visible care economy. And then there is the slightly less visible, which we don't even have the adequate numbers for, because we are estimating how many are doing these informal services. And then the huge sea underneath of the unpaid, for which we, again, have very little information. Okay, now let's just go back to this whole relational activity thing. It's never routine. It cannot be routine. That's the point about it. Except, okay, some basic things. If you're fetching water or you're fetching fuel wood, it's routine. 
I wish it were that routine because increasingly you're finding in India as the water sources dry up, it's not routine. You have to keep moving around, searching different places, finding the next place where the water level hasn't fallen. F collecting fuel wood, which is still a massive, massive thing in India because even when you're providing gas connections, cooking gas connections, they're too expensive for most households. So the women end up keeping that for the special occasion and going out there and collecting firewood anyway. But of course, it's not routine because you don't know where you're going to get it today. You have to move around, you have to forage, literally. And as I said, the numbers involved in doing this are huge. This is just in one country, so you can imagine. So it cannot replace human engagement, even if you can assist it. Now, ideally, you would not want women to go around looking for water, looking for fuel wood. You would want piped connections. You would want access that would reduce it, okay? So yes, you can have technologies that will reduce the drudgery, reduce all of that. But the human element cannot, and you can make some kinds of care more efficiently performed through technology, but you can't replace it. But this is the other aspect of the relational, that you can't really adjust the demand for the direct care services. Indirect, yes, you can you know, use technologies, etc. You can't really adjust the demand for direct care. You can't say, well, this baby is not going to get any care for the you know, next two years because this mother has to work. Somebody will have to be looking after that baby, okay? If somebody is not able to, you will reduce, in fact, the welfare of that child. In other words, you can only adjust the demand for some basic care by reducing quantity and quality to the detriment of the receiver. We see this a lot in geriatric care. A lot of old people left to fend for themselves because you know there isn't anyone. There. So it's it when the adjustment occurs, it occurs if you like in a bad way. It occurs by denying those who need that care. Okay, so it's not something that you can adjust lightly. You can, all those societies do unfortunately adjust lightly. Also, because of this demand for work, that is in a sense you know the demand. Is in, in that sense something that you cannot really get a, uh, dispose of. It means that care work is one of those activities for which societies will continue to need more and more engagement. It's not something that's going to go away. And in fact, with demographic changes in societies, you will find that you get more and more demand for care work. It's not, in the future of work discussions, the fact that the Care work is going to remain an absolutely essential aspect. It's often ignored. Everyone's thinking, oh, future of work, what are we going to do when there are robots, how are we going to adjust, etc. Some of care work, is, because you know, it's, it's, that, it's that poorer cousin of real work. So it's not seen as something that is a very integral part of care work. Also because in societies, we do undervalue it. And we don't give it the recognition, the remuneration, the proper conditions, the rewards that we give other kinds of work. Okay, the other aspect about care work which is very different from most other kinds of work is this whole issue of productivity. Now everyone's always on about how important productivity improvements are and how do we measure productivity output per worker usually. Now in care work this is bizarre, it makes no sense. It's actually completely stupid and counterproductive, if you like, to think of productivity in that way. Because, you know, you require more intensive labor input. If you have fewer nurses per population, that's not going to improve the quality of care. In a purely numerical, you know, quantitative terms, yes, the nurse is more productive. Now the nurse is serving 20 patients rather than 10. But it definitely affects the quality of the care. Okay, so, and yet, yet, governments, markets, everybody persist in these numerical indicators. They persist in saying, well, you know, you have to actually improve. I, I've seen this in a very recent document of the UK as well, about how you can improve uh, the efficiency of care work. And how do you improve efficiency? Always by reducing the people. So, you know, output per worker is, is the critical thing. And uh, it's doubly problematic because output, how do you even define the output of elderly care? Usually, it's not socially valued. 
So if you have you know, so many geriatric care workers and you pay them so much, then that's the output. And since they're usually low paid, that's a low output. So it's one of those low productivity activities. And then you say, well, it's a low productivity activity. We have to become a more efficient, productive society. We have to cut down on the low productivity stuff and move into high productivity stuff, which basically means you cut down on those. Rather than improving their wages and working conditions and recognizing that this is a very important social activity and thereby <laughs> at least numerically improving their productivity. I, 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 does this make sense? Okay. So what happens typically when governments say, well, we have to make it all more efficient, more productive, what do they do? They reduce workers per recipient, essentially. And whether this is childcare or it is you know, uh, geriatric care or it is nurses dealing with the sick, across the board, it's pretty much the same calculus, that you reduce the ratio of caregivers to care recipients. And what does that mean? It basically means overwork of those caregivers, which has direct effects on the quality of the care. And it's not their fault, it's the direct effect. And when overwork happens, it's not just that they're too rushed to, do, to help you, but they are exhausted, they are angry, they're irritated, they're impatient, they have to get on to the next task, the next patient. It changes the quality in more than one way, okay? And can even harm the recipients, okay? So now let's think about technology then. And I, was, I have been saying that technology cannot substitute for care work, which is true. But technology can assist care work. And in fact, what, one of the things we don't think about are the many ways in which we should think about technological changes that can reduce some of the drudgery of care work. It's not something that governments give much attention to. When we think about innovation, we don't think about that. As, a, as an important area for innovation. But in fact, it can be massive because so much care work is done, in fact, in unpaid or underpaid forms. And reducing that drudgery, reducing some of that is crucially important for actually making it more, uh, more beneficial for society in general. So you can think of different kinds of artificial intelligence, new digital technologies that reduce some of that drudgery. Um, it's interesting, Japan, they are in fact quite far advanced in this, in using a lot of artificial intelligence kinds of things to assist human care delivery. Not to substitute for it, but to assist human care delivery. And uh, you know, similarly, it also means therefore that you have to skill the workers who are doing these things. Now, first of all, you have to develop the technologies which are relevant for particular cases. You then have to train the workers who are delivering these care services. And remember, we don't think that people who deliver these care services are skilled. We, we begin with the assumption that these are anyway the bottom of the pile of the workers. They don't have the same kinds of skill requirements, at least in the public mind. But that's one of the important areas. Okay, so now let's think about this whole thing that you know they're not skilled, that they don't need skills so much. Obviously, different kinds of care work require different kinds of skill. There's no question about that. And some, everybody knows, right? Doctors, I mean, you know, high-flying specialists, all of those people, everybody knows that you have to have many, many degrees and lots of experience, and uh, they're defined as skilled. Nurses, a bit less so, okay? Down to the sort of nursing assistant, less so. The, I, I don't know what you call them, but you know, the ward assistants and so on. Even less so. You, you kind of, down the ladder, you start thinking they need less and less skill. No matter what kind of patient or situation they are dealing with. In India, we have this ap appalling situation where we think early childhood development can be put in the hands of local women with no training at all, who have done maybe, you know, five years of schooling. And they can be put in charge of little children because after all, you know, women are doing it all the time anyway at home. Yeah, they're, they're used to doing it. You don't need training for that. You don't need pedagogical training. You don't need to worry about how you actually educate the very young. You don't have to think about those issues in any particular way. So a whole range of things for which, you know, actually you need a lot of skill. You need training. These are simply not recognized as skilled work. And therefore, we don't, as a society, train enough people to do it. Those who are doing it in unpaid form at home, 
get no training at all, obviously. But even those who are doing it in informal settings, and in the Indian case, in formal public sector se settings, even they are not adequately trained for it because it's not seen as activity that needs training. Dealing with you know, older elderly people who have, let us say, dementia. No, you just need patience. You don't need training. You don't need to think about the specific requirements that patients with dementia need and how they have to be handled. And you don't have to train the people who have to do it. So it's a huge. Dealing with differently abled people, that's another huge thing. A lot of that, again, is done within homes, within communities. Again, largely untrained, often unpaid, or very, very low paid. And again, the training that's provided is often seen in terms of assistance, rather than developing the people whom you're dealing with. So there's a huge gap in terms of how societies even see the need for skills and training in care work. So as I said, because of the fact that they are provided without training, that care provision is inadequate. It's not good enough. It's not what the people actually need. So they're all operating in the suboptimal way because they're not getting the care that, not for any reason, you know, not because the caregiver doesn't want to, but because the caregiver has not been trained and skilled in how exactly to deliver that care. And then, of course, we know that it turns out mostly women do it. Okay? Um, because of the gender construction of most societies, the work that women do ends up being undervalued. And when the women are doing it, the whole assumption is that they will kind of learn on the job, because that's what over centuries that we've been doing. You learn to be a mother, so you learn about early childhood development. You learn to look after people in your family, so you learn about nursing. You learn to look after the elders in your household, and so you learn about geriatric care. It's, it, it goes in that way. Then there's the other aspect of care, which is that it's, there's a very strong affective element. It, it's emotional. You can't avoid it. Because it's relational, because you're dealing with people who, in a sense, uh, at least partly are dependent on you, there is an affective element. And so clearly, you know, human emotions, empathy, all of these also play a role. This is really complicated. And it's complicated not just because of the unpaid care work that is often performed part-time or sometimes even full-time at home to family members. Even paid workers, they develop relationships with those whom they care for. And it's a complicated thing. We have found, uh, this is very common in, uh, in many countries, including in Europe, that are undergoing austerity. You know, where, let's say, nurses and other caregivers are, uh, are given part-time kinds of jobs or uh, their wages are reduced and they're made to function in much worse conditions. But they continue doing it because they've developed a relationship with the, care, the, the people whom they're caring for. They can't, you know, they do the self-exploitation because now it means something to them. There is an emotional kind of bond. And so, you know, it's very hard to talk about care, paid and unpaid, without looking at that whole social context. And the, the point about that social context is that it's combining this effective element also then with notions of patriarchy and culture and all of those kinds of things, okay? So, you know, there is this gender division, and of course, as I said, all fundamentally women are responsible all over, but it's also the women persuade themselves that they're responsible. That, you know, it's, it's not just that society is telling you that's your job, you worry that it's your job. I mean, you feel, as a woman, that you know, you're not doing what you should be doing in terms of looking after people in your household. It, it's, it's a very complicated thing. It's not straightforward that, oh, it's just the bad oppressor out there that forcing you to do the unpaid work. There is a combination of the social kinds of, uh, you know, the, the social constructs and the emotional and effective element. Which is why you have this massive feminization of care. So th the, the countries for which we have time use data find that approximately three quarters of the time spent in unpaid care work is spent by women. So it's not that they're doing all of it, no, but broadly across pretty much all societies, and the numbers range from 60 to you know, 90 percent in terms of the share of the unpaid care work that is performed by women, but it's pretty much. And because of that, whether or not women are seen as working, they, they work longer hours than men. All time use studies find 
when you're looking at work rather than employment, that women work longer hours, even the ones who are officially not working, not in the labor force. They're all working and they're working for longer hours. And of course, whether, if you're doing a lot of the unpaid care, then you cannot make yourself available for the paid work. So it affects women's labor force participation. In India, we have this extraordinary situation of declining women's workforce participation. We're one of the few countries in the world growing at you know, seven to nine percent per annum for three decades. Big giant emerging onto the world scene and all of that. Women's workforce participation fell from, 20, from 34 percent to 28 percent and then 24 percent, which is crazy, right? Only a quarter of the women are engaged in paid work. So then it turns out, well, if you include the unpaid care, that is to say you include all the work you do within households, and you do all the fetching and carrying work, that is, you know, gathering fuel, wood, gathering water, doing the kitchen gardening, doing all of that stuff, then 88% of women are working, not 24. And a sight more than men, only 78% of men are working, but 88% of women are working when you include all of that unpaid care work. Okay, so 60% of the women are of this age group 50 plus are engaged in unpaid care work. What kind of subsidy is that to the whole formal economy? You get the picture. What does it mean for our aggregate labor productivity statistics when we're not even counting this enormous labor force that is contributing directly and indirectly to the GDP but not paid for it? So there is this big um, thing which comes out of the fact that so much of this care work is unpaid. And then, of course, it has this other issue, which is that if women do a lot of zero pay work, then the work that women do in other activities gets undervalued. Women work for free, so when they go and work for wages, their wages are lower. Then whatever activities they do, those activities get undervalued. So because women are dominantly nurses, male nurses also get low pay. I'm serious. I mean, this is actually, there is this whole vicious cycle which is that the paid unpaid work continuum, which I will come to uh, uh, in a minute, or oh, do I have, yeah. You see, first of all, anyway, usually a lot of the care is done by you know, lower educational attainment, et cetera, et cetera, because we don't see it as skilled. And we don't treat, let's say, you know, going in and learning early childhood education as a fancy skill. It's not like, okay. Uh, and then because it's, it, you know, it's not valued, and then it contributes to its devaluation in both market terms and social perception. Okay, now just the gender distribution of care work, I mean, I don't know if you can see this, but basically the men are the brown ones and the women are the gray ones. The first two rows are routine housework and care for household members. Everywhere the women are doing a lot more, okay? In some countries, much, much more like Turkey and so on. In Sweden, the great outlier, just a little bit more. Okay. You go to the other one, how much time do you spend on sports, TV, radio, and sleeping? Well, well, it's these two really that the men do. They sleep about the same as women, okay? <laughs> because the women are exhausted doing all the unpaid housework. <laughs> but the uh, sports and the TV and radio, you can see how the, the whole thing changes, right? The men are doing a bunch more. But Sweden is the great outlier here, and I want to pick up on that. Okay, so we talked about the paid, unpaid, uh, I just want to mention that because women are doing all this, you get this thing called time poverty. And you know, there's an idea that time poverty is what all these fancy executives have, you know, the ones who are zipping around the world and have to do the PowerPoints on the computer before their next meeting, you know, on the flight and you know, all of that. But the real time poverty is actually of the poor. Because the poor are in fact the most time poor of all. And it's not just that because they're poor, they have to work longer, they have to go longer for commuting, they have to do all of these things, that they, are, you know, they have more time poverty. But that time poverty contributes to material poverty. It makes things worse for them. Why? Because when you have these double burdens, you come back home after an exhausting day, you then have to cook, clean, feed the kids, blah, blah, blah. you do that badly. So the quality of the goods and services that you provide in the household also falls, which is never thought about. Time poverty is never included in any, even in the multidimensional concepts of poverty. So we never think about how time poverty adds to material poverty, but it does really. And it's a lot because of this unpaid care. So basically, both the quantity and the quality of the goods that are delivered by time poor people 
deteriorates. And, and since it's mostly poor people, therefore they're even poorer than they seem, if you see what I mean. It's not just that they have low wages, but they also have worse quality of those kinds of goods and services, which they are forced to deliver for themselves. Okay, it's not therefore a disease of the rich. Okay, it's essentially much, much worse for the poor and adds to their material deprivation. I just want to briefly mention that there's also now a new thing which is the kind of globalization of care work. We have a global value chain of care which has emerged. Uh, typical example, you know, um, I have a friend who is an academic in Rome. She is able to work and do all her things, uh, everything she does because she has a live-in Filipina maid who actually takes care of a lot of the domestic work for her. This uh, Filipina woman has left her family in Metro Manila, uh, look, being looked after by her sister. And her sister has come from a rural area of the Philippines to look after her children. So you get displaced motherhood. This Filipina woman is looking after the Italian woman's children. But you also get this global value chain of care, which is actually pretty widespread now. It's a, uh, you know, uh, and in fact, 80% of all female cross-border migration now is for domestic work, for women. Huh? That's really something very, very remarkable, just to give you an idea. And of course, most of these women, domestic workers are women, and it's pretty spread across the world. So there's a global value chain of the care work and the very bottom of that value chain is the unpaid worker. The sister from rural area of Metro, you know, of the Philippines coming and working in Metro Manila is at that bottom of that value chain. But finally, I just want to say that it's not just that it's all terrible, and, which it is of course, but you know, then there's all this dreadful gender construction and so on and so forth. But in fact, we could actually make this an opportunity. If we recognize the significance of care work and its employment generation potential, you could actually think of a much better way of using that to ensure stable employment in the future, okay? Because of its re relational nature, because of changing demography. Now, essentially though, it means you have to do this through public in intervention. You cannot expect markets to do this, because if they were gonna do it, they would have done it by now. What they do give you is the globalization of those care services. They do not give you properly, adequately provided good quality care services. So, you know, obviously there's a demand for care and many things will affect it. The demographic patterns, the level of income, the kind of income inequality you have, the social attitudes to care and how you feel those who need it should be treated, how well you want to look after the young, the old, the, the sick and etc whether you have you know, single member households, just couples living, and then you know, the primary caregiver is also an elderly person looking after another elderly person, all kinds of things. The increase in psychological care needs, we are completely underplaying this, but it's very significant. And it's in fact, not just in the developed world, but even in countries like India, we do not adequately look after the psychological needs of society, which leads to all kinds of crazy things. For example, I was hearing about the stabbings in in London of, of young, uh, young men and so on. There are all kinds of issues that come from this. And of course, the basic infrastructure. Do you really have to walk to fetch your food, wood and water? Do you really have to do all of that kind of stuff? Do you have devices that help you in food processing? Do you have stuff that will grind the spices for you so you don't have to spend hours doing all of that? All of these, obviously, available technologies will also affect the demand for care. But how do we actually decide what's a desirable level of care? Now, I showed you Sweden, didn't I? One of the, you know, the best country in that list anyway, in terms of the time spent on housework, the time spent on care work within the family, unpaid, and the gender distribution. It was the most equal. It wasn't completely equal, but it was the closest, okay? So let's just take Sweden as the best available example we have of providing care. It's obviously not ideal, it's not perfect, there are issues, but among the countries we know, let's take Sweden as a good example, as care services are, let's say, reasonably adequately provided. Now let's take Sweden's employment levels. I have the data for 2014 of the labor force surveys and you know, which 
people are in which activities, to estimate the number of care workers per hundred, okay, for every different category. So I, I then looked at these ratios and I applied these to the projected population of the whole world in different regions for 2030. Why? Because 2030 sustainable development goals were supposed to have achieved utopia and become perfect. So let's aim for that one. Okay. So what are the care worker ratios in Sweden? Just health workers, you know, which is all of these, you know, healthcare managers, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, all of, the, all of them, okay? Sweden in 2014 had one worker for 12.82 people. Yeah, I know you can't get 0.82 people, but you know, <laughs> it's a ratio, right? Childcare workers, one worker for 3.6 children, children of that age group, yeah? Elderly care workers, one worker for 16.24 elderly people. So I took the population projections for all the different regions of the world, and I applied these ratios for 2030 for the entire population, for the young and for the elderly. And what do I get? Massive numbers. You would need 663 million healthcare workers, 340 million childcare workers, 86 million elderly care workers, okay? That's what you would need as a society just to provide Sweden levels of population. We're not getting into the other stuff, okay? Most of this is Asia, all right? Uh, which is the red one here. And a significant part after that is Europe. No, Europe is the green one, I'm sorry. This is Europe, the green one, and Northern America. Okay, but Asia, obviously, we have more people anyway, so. But most of this is Europe. And similarly, even for childcare workers, it's mostly, once again, Asia. But hey, even elderly care, everyone thinks that it's the West and the North which is, you know, aging. But Asia is aging even more rapidly and we will have many, many more elderly people in another 15 years than the rest of the world combined. So elderly care workers also, many more in Asia. Now what does that mean? It means that direct employment, just imagine you would get all that much new direct employment. Yeah, I forget, what was it, 1.4 billion, I think it comes to the total of all of these people. And then you, and that's a huge significant proportion of the working age population, if you actually were able to provide that level of services, okay? And of course, this is just the direct care. Then you need all the supportive infrastructure. We haven't even talked about all the people who would be managing, looking after, doing the security, doing the cleaning, doing the, you know, the entire range of activities that provide the supportive, indirect, care for the direct care workers, which would be another vast number, which I, I haven't try, even tried to calculate. And, but these are underestimates, okay? Why? Because there are only three types of care that I have identified. There's lots of other, I haven't even talked about mental health issues, I haven't talked about the, the, you know, the differently abled, I mean, there are many different kinds of care that are required, which I've not even brought in here. And, in addition, remember I told you, it has very, very strong multiplier effects. So if you employ all those people, you're automatically generating much more income, employment, output, and you know, you're going to get a, the real bubble up that, that Minsky was talking about in terms of growth. So there's a huge potential for the care economy as an employment generator in the future. The point though is that you have to avoid these big inequalities among care workers. I mean, the obvious one is, you know, the doctor on top and the nursing assistant at the bottom who is getting, you know, close to nothing, or the ancillary workers, as they call them now, in India and elsewhere, who are South Africa, India, we all, the government relies on these ancillary workers who are made to perform healthcare work without actually, uh, you know, getting proper salaries, not even the minimum wage in India, okay? So high status care work gets a lot of, you know, I mean, the fancy guys get a lot of uh, this, but the low status care work has a wage penalty, actually. The wage penalty is when even the men get paid low because women are doing it mostly, yeah? And it's less le regulated labor markets, terrible conditions, often very stressful, very emotionally demanding, all of these things. More feminized, all of, th all of these problems. So, therefore, that's the importance of public survey purpose in all of this. That's why if you recognize that care has a public value, 
then the public purpose must be to expand the care economy, and it has to be done by public spending. It's not going to happen with the market, okay? How the public spending will obviously direct public investment and expenditure on care services, but also you can do fiscal transfers. You can provide child support that enable people to hire, I mean, proper child support, not some miserable, you know, 10 pounds a month kind of thing, but enough to actually enable child support, old age disability payments that, you know, enable private care services. But all the providers have to actually be given proper wages and working conditions. They have to all be provided minimum wages, subject to all kinds of social protection, and all of that. And of course, then you'll get massive employment multipliers, which you'll get more tax revenue from. So in a way, this pays for itself, not just in good ways, but you know, but it also means that you know, the public intervention has to get it right. So you do this combination, but you do not add to the inequalities. In India, we are trying to provide health services by hiring Okay, I'm ex ex exceeding my time, but I have to give you this example, even though it sucks. Okay, uh, so we provide health services in something called the National Health Mission uh, through a group of women called ASHAs. ASHA stands for Accredited Social Health Activist. ASHA in Hindi means hope, which is a really cruel irony because these accredited social health activists who have 17 functions, they're running the public health system, are not seen as workers. They are activists, and so they get paid 500 rupees a month. Okay, 500 rupees is uh, five pounds. Wow, yeah, five pounds a month. Okay, some states have very generously increased that amount to 10 pounds a month. And the whole D and so minimum wage is like you know this is maybe one fourth, one fifth of the minimum wage, not even. Okay. So that you have to call them volunteers, activists. You are running your entire public health mission with these underpaid workers who are, not, who are trained for three weeks and then told to go out there and help with the vaccination, take women to get the you know, uh, antenatal checkup, do, take them to hospital when they need it, to uh, deal with you know, all kinds of, all the public health issues of their particular locality. Now, that's absolutely the wrong way to do it. So you have to do it properly. When you're going to employ all those millions of people, you have to do them. You have to give them proper jobs with proper conditions and proper facilities. Similarly, every time you have fiscal austerity, what's the first thing you cut? You cut all the care work. You look at Greece, you look at Spain, you look at Italy. It's care work that gets cut first because it's the, it's the one that's seen as the soft target that you can reduce. So you have to stop seeing that as the first thing that you can cut. And in fact, think of it as the first thing you have to expand. But in fact, in care work, it's both wages and conditions of work. We forget that care work is very demanding. It's very psychologically demanding. It's not just physically arduous. It's not just long hours. It's emotionally draining. And so it's important to recognize that it's difficult work and that the conditions of work have to actually be more uh, amenable. So finally, I'm sorry to have taken longer. Finally, what do we do? Well, it's called the four hours. You recognize care work when it's happening, you reward it, you reduce it as much as you can, you reduce the drudgery, you reduce, and you redistribute it. You redistribute across uh, public, private, family, community, and between men and women. Within the family, it shouldn't be, I mean, it should be closer to Sweden than Turkey, shall we say, uh, the, the, the amount of the care work that has been done. And of course, reduction, you can use the technological advances. And then finally, there is, you could call it another hour, but essentially, care workers also need to mobilize. So both paid and unpaid, you have to think about the mobilization of care workers and their representation in the policies that affect them. So it's not just enough to say, okay, we're going to be very nice to care workers from now on. They are the ones who know what they're experiencing, what they're going through, what their difficulties are. So we have to have their representation and their mobilization to ensure the better conditions. Finally, therefore, if you do all this, you recognize the importance and so on, then you're going to serve public purpose at multiple levels, okay? You're going to have more and better quality employment. That's going to generate multiplier effects, which is going to give you much better economies. It's going to give you improved conditions of life. And you'll get genuine productivity growth, not that false productivity growth that comes because you're undercounting the workers. 
and you're allowing this unpaid care work to subsidize the real economy. And finally, you'll get happier, healthier, and more peaceful societies as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for such a fantastic uh, presentation, if um, sort of a plea undertones, if you will, uh, but also very hopeful. Uh, so we now have time for a question and answer. So just raise your hand if you have a question. And yeah, there is the first one. And Lucas will give you the microphone because we are taping it. Hi, I'm Crystal. Thank you so much for that. It was great. I'm really interested in this area. Um, it was great when you were talking about you know, things that can be done at the end, um, especially when you said mobilisation of care workers, for instance, to change things. Because I think that governments will be resistant to this, because obviously it means investing more and then waiting to you know, see that happen. Yeah. And I also think even the most liberal of people will be resistant to potentially paying someone who cleans their house or looks after their children double the amount, which is probably what they should be. Um, so I suppose my question is, how do you think that as, as a society, so, you know, everyday people who use, you know, use these services, who use people to, you know, clean their houses and look after their kids and pay them, you know, a small amount of money per hour, um, you know, unregulated zero-hour contracts and things like that. How do you persuade us? How do you persuade that? Because I feel like that, because obviously you can have people mobilising, which for me seems like the only yes. way if they're doing it themselves and pushing to make it happen. Um, but I wonder, how do you mobilise the people who are actually using these services to care enough to part with more of their cash to pay these people yes. more? That, that's what I wonder. And also, um, slightly separate, um, I wonder, do you know much about um, Wages for Housework campaign by uh, Selma James, which looked at, um, which is another area, which is actually about unpaid work rather than yes. low-paid workers. Yeah. Um, and you pay women who are looking after their children. Um, yeah. a certain amount of money and that's actually yeah. the start of kind of how it's valued and I'd just like to get your, sure. your thoughts on that because obviously yeah. that's a massive thing as well, you know, people doing invisible care. Yeah. Yes, okay, how do you persuade in the informal care economy, how do you persuade the employers to actually be nice? Well, you can't, right? I mean, it's not just the informal economy, formally, you know, formal as well. Employers will always try and pay less and that includes whether it's a big company or it's you and me. Okay, so you essentially have to do it through a combination of legal and mobilization kinds of activities. So, and the two go together. You don't even get laws to change unless you mobilize in the first place. So that, for example, uh, there have been mobilizations of domestic workers in India to the extent that some states have now put in laws that regulate their contracts. And we have now minimum wages for domestic workers in eight states which was a product of that mobilization. And some other states where we don't have it, but you have unions of domestic workers. And so suddenly all you know, these middle class families are really angry because they have to get a double the amount they're paying because they're going on strike otherwise and they're not going to come and do this work. So it, would, it has to be, yeah, you can't rely on the goodwill, unfortunately. It doesn't work, you know. I mean, it, it has to be a combination of creating a legal kind of framework that that puts clear rules and, and you know, conditions of work and so on. Uh, the Domestic Workers Convention of the ILO is a very good starting point. It has really excellent kinds of norms. Uh, and you know, simple things like a, a written contract, which is very rarely provided. Uh, one day off a week, again, unusual to get one day off a week for ma in many cases. And, and you know, it's all zero hours contracts effectively, as you mentioned. Uh, so that, that's one way to start. Of course, enforcing it is very difficult because you, know, you cannot go and enter every house and check on what, how everyone is doing it. So enforcing in turn requires mobilization. So yes, the mobilization is absolutely key. The second question you had um, in terms of the uh, wage pay wages housework. for housework. Yeah, you know, <laughs> It sounds good, but I think it's, it's not just a non-starter. I think it's actually missing the point in a way, okay? Um, because, and in fact, there was a minister in India uh, in the previous government who suddenly decided that this is a good idea, and she, she announced that there was, henceforth, you know, the men were going to pay their wives so much, <laughs> which is ridiculous, I think, because uh, the idea, I would say, would be to recognize, redistribute, okay? Reduce where possible and to 
redistributed between family, public, community, and within the household between men and women, okay? This whole thing will just reinforce the division of labor where women are, you know, uh, seen and that this is your natural job and you're now going to get paid for it. And of course it completely ignores the other reality which is that as you go down the income pole, they're less and less able to reward uh, their wives for you know, any, any of this activity. Uh, so in a sense, I think it, it's missing the point about the nature of care work, which is that it's not that you have to um, give a monetary value to the unpaid care work that is done within the house but that you must seek to in recognize, society must recognize it and value it, and as far as possible reduce it, especially when it is very arduous or involves a lot of drudgery and so on, and then redistribute it, okay? The rewarding of that care work when it is done outside should be, I think, a big issue. But if you are paying a lot for it when you do purchase it, when you purchase that service, then you're a little bit more conscious of how nice it is when it's done in unpaid form. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I think that kind of works both ways in a way. So yeah, I, I, I don't think this wages for, for housework thing, you know, my own feeling is, is that I don't think it really works. Yeah. Josh. Yeah. Thanks, Jarati, really, really enjoyed that. Josh from IIPP. Um, I wanted to test you out on two yeah. sort of quite popular proposals recently that some people argue might address this problem. One of them is um, this idea of a, a reduced working week, so a three-day or uh, a three-day or four-day working week. Uh, the idea being that if you made that legally enforceable, mm -hmm. it would naturally redistribute to some extent uh, potentially some of this, this care labor between men and women perhaps, or more generally people would have more time for care because they would be working less. The other, the other policy is the sort of universal basic income mm. idea, which is debated a lot, uh, whereby you sort of, if you give people a basic level of, of income, then they have more choice yeah. about whether they spend their time in caring or, or working. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the first one is really, um, what do you mean? The universal basic The first one was the... Reduced working the u Yeah. No, reduced working weeks are good. I mean, uh, what's not to like, right, for sure? <laughs> reduced working weeks. It doesn't have to be four days a week. It can be three days a week. It can be part-time mornings. All of that is good in general, I think. But I'm not so sure that this would necessarily mean that the gender division of labor within households would change. Right. Okay? And that has to do with a much longer battle in terms of you know, patriarchal ideas and notions. And, and, and so it's, uh, I think reduced working weeks have an other thing, which is that, I mean, uh, let's say, you know, certainly in the US, everybody works far too long and it's ridiculous and there's no reason for it. And so you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different, if you like, uh, set of arguments. And so both men and women should be enabled to work l fewer hours. Uh, yes, in general. The care work should, I would argue that also uh, paid work has to recognize the demands of, of unpaid care work. You know what I mean? It has to be a bit more flexible mm -hmm. in terms of, rec oh, well, you know, I have an elderly father with dementia, so I'm going to actually be working, you know, only this much. Mm -hmm. And so it, it should not affect your career. It should not, you know, that kind of thing. If you are taking off, let's say, even three years to be with the child, when you are when it is born, it should not mean that your subsequent career shows that oh you're not a serious worker and you know. Mm -hmm. So that I would argue for that kind of flexibility. Oh, the universal basic income, yeah. You know, uh, okay. I think a UBI is not a bad idea if it is not a substitute for public provision. The fear is, and the likelihood is, that governments see it as a way of saving money, actually. You know, they don't tell you that. In, in India, they're open, they even tell you that. They say, oh, we can cut down on public <laughs> services and just give you the money, and, you know, uh, which is, I think would be an absolute disaster. I think you have to have much more public provision of basic goods and services. Uh, that also ensures more equality. If you give a universal income to everybody, that's problematic. I mean, you know, you and I don't need a universal basic income. Uh, 
if you target it, that's, that's already a kind of you know, shaming thing, you, that you're not working for a living, you're getting, there are all kinds of issues of dignity involved. Um, I do believe that when you work for something, there is an inherent dignity associated with it. Uh, you have to recognize and change the conditions under which people work. But I, I'm much more in favor of employment guarantees. I, I, and I believe that the employment guarantees should be flexible. They should account for different kinds of work mm -hmm. and account for the different capacities of people to work. And people could continue working. Maybe you know there are people in their 70s who can do interesting and creative things. So they should have that option. But I don't like the idea of, um, well, all the countries that have delivered UBI, first of all, they give peanuts. It's not really a living kind of income, okay? Even that famous experiment in Finland and so on, it was not enough to, to live on. Secondly, if you did provide everybody enough to live on, you would get, as Minsky talked about years ago, you would get generalized inflation, and so the real, <laughs> real value of that would come down, okay? And thirdly, I think it denies people that, you know, that, that dignity. I mean, so I'm, I, I don't really feel, I, w I would much rather go for universal provision of good quality public services, which has to be then be accountable, and you have to have all kinds of institutions in place to make it accountable, you know? So all of that is, th is there. Um, and that generates employment. And then along with that, you have an employment guarantee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? At this moment. Yeah, yeah Sue? Yeah. Um, there's a microphone. One, one is some um, work that we've done in the Women's Budget Group, which mm. is in the UK, where we've actually costed how much mm. universal childcare provision would, would mm -hmm. cost. I mean, rather, what we've looked at is what the net cost of it is. So the government has to pay a lot of money to, to provide all the childcare workers. But we've also looked at how much of that would the government get back. And in the UK, it would get... <coughs> This, would, this depends, you can't universalize this for other countries because it depends very much on the individual tax and benefit yeah. system. But it, it appears in this country that you get back about 90% of the cost. And that's not that surprising mm -hmm. because if you think about it, um, childcare provision in a collective setting, it will usually be more mm -hmm. than one child who's looked after per yeah. worker. They want to regulate it very carefully to make sure it's not too many. Um, the, the you have multiplier effects, so there's a lot of other yeah. employment generated. And in the UK, we have a tax system that means that a lot of those workers will start paying taxes, but also we have a benefit system, which means that some of those benefits won't be needed. And in particular, we already pay for quite a lot of childcare, so to provide it mm -hmm. universally rather than in particular forms, means-tested forms that are yeah. provided now, Actually, you really get to about 90%. And what's quite interesting is if you pay those care, those, um, care workers well, so we've looked at both paying mm -hmm. them as they are or paying them at a teacher's wage, mm -hmm. it doesn't make much difference. Mm -hmm. you, you, still, you still recoup about 90% of the, of the costs from that. I've got one yeah. question. We, I think we're in, in the UK, we have... Um, a system that's to a large degree privatised, so, mm -hmm. so that we people get uh, money to buy purchase care, mm -hmm. and that you, you know, one of the things you've talked about, and in particular childcare, is almost entirely privatised now. Um, and one of the effects of that, I think, is you get very poor quality care. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I can see that you could have different systems of care provision besides by the state through um, non-profits. Yeah. Uh, and there are some advantages in having perhaps a mixed system of some public provision mm -hmm. and some non-profits because mm -hmm. they might be a bit more experimental and find new practice. But I can't see how private sector care would ever be good quality care mm -hmm. because I think that the, the, uh, the motives yeah. of private sector provision really yes. go against good quality. It's very, care is very, it's very, high, it's very difficult for a consumer to judge the quality which means that it's very different, difficult yes. to mar work the market yeah. in the yeah. way that choice is supposed to do to yeah. provide good quality care. Um, and I have
have a feeling that we ought to be saying that. Yes, no, you know, I, I think you're on to something there. It's true. Once you have a profit-oriented uh, sort of system of care provision, it will necessarily cut costs and try and maximize them and, and thereby reduce the quality. So that is an issue. You know, th the only difficulty I feel is that in a number of societies where we have the public, it tends to become a little ossified, bureaucratic. So, you know, there's a, there's a constant tension. How do you actually manage this? And even large NGOs can become, you know, sort of bureaucratic, rigid. And the trouble with care is that because it is so personalized and because people have very different kinds of requirements, you know, there may be some elderly gent who requires twice a week and then he's, you know, but he doesn't want it the rest of the time, but no, you have to be there for the entire period. Or, so, you know, so it's, it's a fine balance and I'm not, I agree with you, I, that, you know, pure private is a disaster. Pure public is also, you know, not a disaster, but it has all kinds of issues. And large NGOs we have found also have issues. So it's, it's a tough one. Uh, it seems to me it's an area for innovation yes. in social thoughts. Yes, absolutely. It's an area for innovation in, in <laughs> social settings, basically, the type of institutional form. Yes. You know, one very interesting form, and uh, there's a lot of this now happening, in fact, in Central Europe and, and, and Italy and so on, is the cooperatives. So you have the care cooperatives, which, and there can be all kinds. Of, apparently, there's a granny's cooperative that's doing really well. In, in, uh, I, I think it was in uh, near Trieste or something. So you know, you have that, as you said, you know, different innovative forms of organization of care, which can, uh, yeah, yeah. We yes, we we really need to do. So, but but it does mean that societies have to invest in them. Yes. And it doesn't necessarily, this is not even a government, but it is the society recognizing that they need this and, and they are going to invest adequately in it. Thank you. There is a question here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure if this is going to be a question or a oh, comment, yeah. but I just wanted to hear your thoughts. <coughs> One of the figures you showed yeah. was about, um, I think it was the, the number of people who were going to be in direct, you know, in a caring position. Um, if you use if the you Sweden use ratios. Sweden yeah. model yeah. for the 2030, yes, I think. Yes, yes. Um, but with the rising, um, you know, aging population, mm. and we're not talking about necessarily healthy aging yeah. population, um, and with declining sort of birth rates, yeah. I mean, how do you think those, I mean, were those figures sort These of are projections. These those? are the UN population projections for 2030. But so they're not controlled for those kinds yes, of Yes, they are. They, they are, are projecting. Controlled. They are assuming that the aging population will rise by this ratio. So it's a projection based on the past and their own assessments of how populations will change. Right. So, yeah. right. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a demographic projection, which is saying, so this is not the same ratio of old people that there is today. It's yeah. a larger ratio. Yeah. That's why, for example, Asia was so big against so yeah. one, yeah? yeah? So it's assuming that, you know, it's going to age in the following way. Okay. Many assumptions, though. You're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. May I? Yes, sure. Um, you included in uh, those projections uh, preschool and uh, primary school yeah. teachers. And I'm, wo I'm wondering whether you can extend much what you said about care to secondary uh, education and even university education, because you might think it's fundamentally relational. Um, I think there's a very high proportion of women working in those professions, yeah. even in Europe. Um, so I was wondering whether you can um, expand on, on to yeah. which extent even, you might think that even at universities, the, the um, uh, educational aspect of uh, yeah. uh, teaching of, uh, of professors is not so much valued, it's just the research output that is valued. Do you think this uh, comes from yes. that? Yeah, yeah I, yes, I think what you're raising is, is, a, is a also a broader philosophical point, which is that there are a lot of activities which are seen where they involve more of the care element, they are kind of lower down on, in, in the hierarchy. So, you know, if you're a high-flying researcher, then you are there, but if you're just, you know, the boring person teaching somebody maths, it's not, yeah. Yes, um, I haven't done it for, you know, beyond 
primary, okay? Uh, because it then becomes complicated. Then you would have all kinds of people pointing fingers saying, oh, you know, you can't include other school educators you, in care specifically. And it's true that it's, it goes beyond care per se. But I think what you put your finger on is, is an important philosophical point, which is to say that in all activities that have both elements, we tend to downplay the care element, you know? And, and society as a whole, it's not, and government as well, everybody downplays the care element, which also means that um, we end up depriving our, uh, our societies of much needed things which are important for the health of society. And I can think immediately of two examples. <coughs> In India, the public universities now, uh, they, most of them have not even hired therapists. Now, I don't know, I, about universities here, but boy, I can tell you we need therapists, <laughs> big time. <laughs> oh my God, you know, I mean, there have been students for whom I have actually gone myself and paid for the therapy because they were in such bad shape and we don't have them, which is crazy, you know? So there's no funding for therapy in universities, whereas you know that all these children are going through crises and <laughs> really need help, okay? Um, the Netherlands, when it's period of uh, completely unrequired austerity, because they were doing fine and they still are, but they decided to cut down on psychological care services provided by the state. <coughs> and they have had a very substantial increase in all kinds of uh, social discord and uh, basically insecurity resulting from the fact that a whole bunch of people have not got the, the psychological help that they needed at an appropriate time because it's become unaffordable. And so families, it's not just families and neighborhoods, but it's now the entire society is dealing with this explosion of mental illness, uh, which has come about, I won't say it's directly because of the lack of care, but certainly it's associated with the fact that it wasn't caught early. Again, the schools don't have enough of them there aren't enough public people whom you can go to who are affordable, and, and then that compounds itself until you get to a point where there are all these people in, in deep crisis who create, you know, who are violent or who create all kinds of other concerns. So, yes, yes, you are right, that in pretty much a whole bunch of other areas, we underplay the need for care, and it's not just that we don't invest in it, but we don't value it. The people who do it, as you said, they are not valued, and that's that's important. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Puja. Hi, Jaisi. Uh, I was particularly struck by the chart of all the different countries mm -hmm. and the sort of ratio between yeah. men and women. Yeah. And I guess the sort of question is like, how can you? Is there how can you put evidence to the sort of wider issue of patriarchy in culture and society versus this sort of ratio or, I mean oh, and yeah. also it's like why why is it that Philippines export why is that such a big kind of industry yeah their women okay so actually there are two different questions so one you're saying um, how come how come Sweden managed to be kind of okay, whereas, <coughs> I mean, we don't have India here. If we had India here, we no, would be we out there with, we would be out, because we didn't have a tiny new survey, but we would be out there with Turkey. In fact, possibly worse, you know, but, uh, um, yeah. But, you know, darling, what you're asking is how do you get rid of patriarchy? And boy, <laughs> 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 I wish I knew. I wish I knew, I promise you. Uh, yeah, uh, can we, can we, put a, um, can we put some quantitative metrics on what is patriarchy? I think we can, okay? This is one, for example, okay? I'm not saying there's no patriarchy in Sweden, but it's a bit less than it is in some of these other countries. China is another big gap, for example. Um, uh, the number of, you know, the sex ratio, it's a classic indicator of patriarchy. China and India, the two countries in the world with declining sex ratios at birth, okay? So we kill off the, the, the girl children in the womb because we undervalue them as a society. So, you know, there are metrics we can use. Um, dropout rates of boys and girls in schools. You know, if you're a tribal girl in a, rur in a rural part of India and you join uh, school, you have a 1% chance of finishing school. So, you know, yeah, we ha enrollment is fine. We've got universal primary school enrollment. <laughs> but, you know, and so there are those kinds of, so I think we can get metrics of patriarchy. 
how we change those metrics, <laughs> how we fix it. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, that, that one I will leave to all of you. You know, you, you, especially you younger lords, you have to go out there and fix it. <laughs> we, we haven't been able to, and now it's your turn. <laughs> um, yes, the, the second uh, question was, um, Oh, the Philippines. Yes, you know, this is very interesting. And this also, it's, it's socially constructed. There are certain societies, so uh, some of it is the network effect. You know, a few go and then more go. And then, you know, then the, they follow their sisters or their friends and, and then they create a network. And, and so you will always find migration goes in particular kinds of, you know, uh, there are these clear channels. But if you look, for example, at Asia, it's the Philippines, it's Sri Lanka, and it's Kerala. Okay, Kerala, the state of India, which are sending a lot of women mm. as care worker migrants. And this is the entire range. They go from nurses to domestic workers. But uh, in the Philippines, women outnumber men migrants as 13 to 1. In Sri Lanka, it's 8 to 1. In Kerala, it's about equal. Okay, the equal numbers of men. But remember, Kerala, it's a very, and these are interesting anomalies because in the Philippines and Sri Lanka, work participation rates of women are pretty high. Mm -hmm. In Kerala, they are not. Women, in fact, are highly educated, but they don't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So it's a very patriarchal society in its own way. Nonetheless, you have this expansion of, of, of them, uh, a very, very significant expansion. And one of the points which I, I didn't make, but it's quite interesting, is that when you have a lot of these women migrants, your remittances are very stable. So, you know, f if you have a global crisis, and you have a lot of male migration, then you know, my remittances collapse. So in 2008, 2009, remittances to Mexico, Pakistan, everywhere, they just collapsed because you know, all those industries, manufacturing, construction in the uh, destination countries were doing very badly. But where you have lots of women migrants, in fact, it's much more impervious to the business cycle in the destination country because those services do not get you know, immediately abandoned. So you'd had no decline in Philippines, no decline in Sri Lanka, no decline in India of the remittances. So it's a, it's a kind of macroeconomic stabilizer for the women, yeah? uh, for, the, for the country, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, hey, so, so using the privilege of sitting yeah. here with you, so <laughs> I wanted to ask a question yeah. as well. And this is, uh, goes back to the, uh, what Pooja asked about um, the politics of it all. You mentioned, yeah. um, mobilization as a, as a really the key aspect of it, I mm. think. And of course, the, John Kenneth Colbright wrote about, you know, the countervailing power yeah. as being really the way how yeah. societies yeah. can actually evolve. I think that's, that's really important. But I, I was also really wondering more on the representation level, whether that's one of the key aspects of actually that keeps this problem not being solved because women are not represented as much as, as they should yeah. be. And whether there is a, a a lot of work to be done actually around quotas in parliaments, in politics, in boards. Yes. Or all of you. Yes. Yes, yes. I actually, I am a big believer in quotas. Okay. Uh, it, there's a huge debate in India about quota politics, you know, because we have quotas for castes and then, you know, everyone's very angry and they say there's merit and all of this nonsense, you know, which is. Um, uh, I'm a big believer in quotas basically because I think you need enough of a presence to make a difference. You know, we have had in South Asia, we've had women prime ministers in every country and so on. It doesn't make a difference because you can't change the culture of the thing. You know, so like one third is enough. You have enough warm bodies to change the culture of a, of a place. Because otherwise where you have just a few women making it to the top, they have to, they end up being like men and they have to be, you know, to survive and to get up in that system and so on. So, I mean, you, you had Maggie Thatcher here and so on, right? So it's a different, um, you need enough, you need, uh, uh, you need a critical mass. And I would say 10% is too little. I think that's the EU thing on boards, isn't it? I think it's 10% women, 20. It's 30. Is it It depends on the, yeah, if you're a listed, ah. uh, listed company on okay. stock exchange, ah. then you have to have 30. 30 is good. I would say 30, 30 is, is a start. I think it's 30. Yeah? Or am I yeah. wrong? Okay. Yeah. Having said that, sometimes it, it, it works even beyond your expectations. So, you know, when we had the Employment Guarantee Act in India, the National Rural Employment Guarantee, which was, you know, we really managed to fight, it's a promise of the government to offer 100 days of work to every rural household. In fact, they haven't given 100 days, it's more like 40 to 50 days, but nonetheless, it's something. 
And we fought and managed to get 30% to be reserved for women. But it turns out that, in fact, more than half has been women. More than half of the employment generated has gone to women. And that's really because this program offers you the same wages. So there's no gender gap in this. Whereas in the market, you know, women get approximately 60% of the male wage. So you have lots of women coming into this. And then the men thinking, oh, well, if, you know, usually the, then they withdraw. They're less interested when the whole thing is taken over by maids. And then the, the Kerala example of this is very interesting because in Kerala, I every work site has what is called a mate, the person in charge. And they made all the mates women. <laughs> and it completely changed. Again, Kerala has massive women's involvement in the rural employment guarantee and in migration, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. OK, thank you so much. Yeah. I think we are exactly on time. And before yeah. we uh, thank Jayati again, I, I just remind you that you can't keep thanking me enough <laughs> already. <laughs> uh, just we are halfway through of our lecture series, so there are six more lectures this year. So please check the flyers, and I think the next lecture is by Lucy Musgrave, and it's already in 26th of uh, June. So please come back, and the topic will be very different, but as exciting and as in, as interesting. So. Please join me in thanking Charity again for the wonderful lecture. Thank you.